I'd like to share with you a thought that I had for Ne'ila on Yom Kippur. I actually delivered the gist of it yesterday in our Beis HaKnesses. The word Ne'ila, not coincidentally, means to tie. And specifically, we use it for Ne'ila Sasandal, to tie on a shoe. The opposite is called chalitza or siluk, to remove a sandal. And as you know, on Yom Kippur, we remove our na'alayim. And yet, ne'ilah is called ne'ilah, as if to say we put back on our na'alayim. So we'll ask two questions, and then maybe one more. Question number one, why is it that ne'ilah seems to be the exact opposite of what we do on Yom Kippur. Secondly, why do we actually not wear shoes on Yom Kippur? There are many answers to that question. Uh, one of them that's very famous in the name of Nefesh HaChayim, that the shoe ties the feet, so to speak. It chokes the feet and incarcerates the feet. And that represents the human body incarcerating the Neshama. And on Yom Kippur, when we want to free the neshama, so to speak, of its goof through all the nuyim and being like malachim and reaching high levels of Hashem, so we take off our shoes. Others say that since HaKadosh Baruch Hu is right there, it's Biyoso Karov on Yom HaKippur, and therefore it's not appropriate to wear shoes, like Moshe Rabbeinu was told at the snare, Shalna Na'alecha Mi'al Raglecha. And still others say that the shoe represents a Kenyan acquiring something because when we derive the Kenyan of Sudar, which is the paradigm of Kenyan, and we derive it in, in Sefer Rus, it says Na'al in the Pasuk. And Yom HaKippurim is a day in which we come divested of our possessions. Again, as I said before, there are a host of different explanations for the philosophy behind the Ila Sasanda question that we asked yesterday, which is again a famous question, is why is it that when we recite the Vidu in the Tfila of Ne'ila, we only focus really on one sin. Again, we recite the short Vidu of Hashamdu, but the only hate that specifically mentioned is Ochek Yodneinu. Laman Nechtal Mi Ochek Yodneinu. It appears more than once in the Ne'ila. And Ochek means, in a sense, when you take advantage of another person. And the question is, why are we focused totally on that Avera during our Ne'ilah? I introduced my talk yesterday, right before Ne'ilah, by pointing out that usually during Ne'ilah, the Darshanim focus on one Avera because you can't cover the entire gamut. But let's see if as we're in this uplifted state of Ne'ilah, about to experience the Hasima Sadin, if we can focus at least on one Avera that seems to be quite common, and perhaps during the Ila dedicate ourselves to try to rectify that Avera du Chu. But what Avera do we want to focus in on? I want to first mention to you, by way of introduction, an insight of Rav Shlomo Zaman Arab. He says that then a lion, when they're made from leather, again, you could wear sneakers that are very comfortable, maybe even more comfortable than leather shoes. You're allowed to wear that on Yom Kippur because although you may enjoy and experience oneg, but the Torah prohibited ne'ila. And ne'ila means a minol, and a minol means that it's made of leather. And the question is why? Why are we so allergic to leather? Now we know that the entire universe is divided up into segments and it's a pyramid that goes from inanimate objects, which is called domain. Then you get to a higher level, which is domeach, vegetation. The vegetation again gets its sustenance from the ground. So we're up to the next level. And then from domeach, we go up to Chai, which represents the animal kingdom, and the animals will be sustained by tzomeach, by vegetation, until we get to Adam. Now, Adam 
is a medaber. He's on the high point of the pyramid because he can take the animals. And again, if you're Jewish, you shech them. If you're non-Jewish, you kill them and enjoy the flesh of the animals and eat and sustain himself. Again, I'm not talking to vegetarians right now. But for those of us who eat meat, then our dominion over the animal kingdom is represented by the ability for us to eat its flesh. And we have control over the animals. We are on a higher level on the pyramid. However, we go even more higher in our dominion over the animals. And that is not only do we eat the flesh of the animals after we check the animal, but moreover, we take the hides of the animal and we tan them and process the manufacturing leather. That represents, in a sense, the epitome of man's dominion over the entire universe because in his control and his domination over Chai, he even reaches the level of leather, of taking the hides, the R, and enjoying the benefit of those. Says Rabbi Shalom Zalman, that attitude of domination over the world is absolutely antithetical to the spirit and the goal of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur, man sent in front of the Almighty in a state of hachna to subjugate himself to the will of God. And therefore, this is not appropriate in the mood and the attitude of Yom HaKippurim to wear shoes and demonstrate our power, our dominion over the universe. That's antithetical to Yom HaKippurim, where we stand close and in front of and counting the Almighty God, the Tower of Towers, the Master of Masters, infinity, and here man has to be home, and therefore he's not to wear shoes. This concept of dominion, of control, which seems to be negative and excluded on Yom HaKippur, nevertheless, it really seems to be positive. God creates man and commands him vikiv shua, to conquer the world, to subjugate the universe, and to manifest dominion over the world. So there seems to be a little bit of a contradiction here between the spirit of Yom HaKippurim and wearing shoes antithetical to Yom HaKippurim so far as it shows what great dominion we have when God put us here on this earth, man is created to have dominion and to manifest dominion, which seems to be a positive feature. We'll get back to that in just a minute. First, I want to share with you a catastrophic episode that took place during the Roman persecution of the Jews, as recorded by Shmuel, the Amora Shmuel, in the Gemara and Shabbos. And that's the Gemara tells us that there was a gzera not to wear what's called Andalim misumarin. Misumarin means these were special shoes that were made in which the sole was attached to the leather of the shoe with nails. And you could imagine that wearing such a shoe could be dangerous if you misuse it. Today, I think in contemporary life, the closest thing to this kind of a shoe as described by the Gemara would probably be shoes that are worn on the sports fields, maybe in baseball and other, other, and other activities, other sports. What was the background to the Xero? When the Romans were persecuting the Jews, the Jews hid in caves. And the policy in the cave was, once you're in, you're in. You're allowed to enter into the cave, but no one leaves the cave. In effect, the cave becomes a prison where you're not allowed to leave it. Why is it that they made that uh, rule? Because when a person leaves the cave, he might not be aware of the fact that the eyes of the adversaries, of the Romans, are upon him, and they will see him leaving the cave. They'll know that there are Jews hiding in the cave, and that's the end of the Jews who are hiding from their adversaries. 
On the other hand, if someone comes into the cave, we can assume that he tested negative, meaning he checked out and he made sure that there were no Romans looking at him. And that's it. On one occasion, and this is what brought about a terrible tragedy, someone came into the cave, but he wore his Nalayim Misumaros backwards. He had put him on backwards. The Jews in the cave saw the footsteps that looked like instead of somebody coming in, which was the truth, somebody going out. And mass bedlam broke out. The Jews were absolutely overwhelmed by fright, thinking that now within minutes, the Romans are going to see these you know, these footsteps going out of the cave, they'll trace them and track them back to the cave and destroy all the Jews hiding in the cave. And in this mass bedlam, Jews actually started attacking other Jews. It was just crazy. There was no, there was no sanity. And as a result of these shoes, which they stomped on other people, many, many Jews perished. And as a result, the Chacham instituted Xera that on Shabbos and Yontif, we don't wear these kinds of shoes. It would seem to me, and this is my own, my own uh, if you like it, you'll call it a chiddush or an insight, that on a philosophical level, what was terrible here, symbolically in the policy of the Jews, was, yeah, you could join us, but no way out. Once you come in, no way out. And this, I think, is a reflection of the concept of dominion, of control. You know, in psychology, they talk about control freaks. There are people who are aggressive. Many of them hold powers of leadership, and they dominate. Yeah, you could come in. But you got to play by our rules. You either do it my way or the highway. And what we tend to do in such a case, and it's a terrible avera, is we manifest that control over others and we change their thinking, their behavior patterns. We don't tolerate anything that deviates from what's inside. You're locked inside. In fact, the word now comes to the Shoresh of Na'ul, which means you're locked. You come into our society and you're locked. And I think this is a, a, <coughs> a sin and a deficiency that has entered into our lives on so many different levels, whether it be in a business situation. Yeah, you can join our business, you can apply, but you got to play with our rules. Or even in family relationships, in Husband and wife, you know, one dominates the other and says, yeah, these are the rules. We got to do it my way. And parents and children, very often, the child feels somewhat smothered. There's no room for freedom because the parents will impose their opinion on him. We've got to be open, not only to allow people to enter, but also to allow them to enter with their ideas that reflect and behavior patterns that reflect their personality rather than try to coerce them to accept our way. We cannot allow them in and then lock them up in a jail, incarcerate them in terms of every way they live and they behave. And this sin, I think, is something that we have to work on. On this Yom Kippur Eve, on Motzi Yom Kippur going into the Elah, Take off the Nalayim. The Nalayim, as we saw in the name of Shomaz Zalman, represent dominion. In fact, the enemies really stomp on us with their shoes. I don't want to talk about the Holocaust, but this is something very dangerous. And you have to do it my way. That's the phenomenon that I called before well-known control freak. And if we don't give freedom to others, we can't do Kiru. You can't build an institution and assume that anyone who joins your institution, whether it's an employer or whether it's a a project of Kiruv, that you can lock them up and impose upon them your way of life. 
your mores, your attitudes. You got to wear your tie in such a way. You know, Dr. Seuss used to write about, um, you know, do you, do you put the jam on the, on the top of the bread, on the bottom of the bread? How do you butter your bread? And to make it uniform. And it's almost like a communistic kind of idea that we control you and you can't leave your house. You know, if you leave past nine o'clock at night, the cops are there and they'll haul you in. This kind of overbearing, locking you in is the na'ila of the sandal. And that was the attitude of the Jews, again, for whatever good reasons, in that ma'ara, in that cavity, in that cave. When the policy was, yes, you can come in, but we're not going to let you out. You're locked in. And that's the, that's the uh, dominion that Rav Shomazan was talking about in Nalayim, represented by Nalayim. But the situation here with regard to this fault is very complex. There's another side to it. As we said before, the Torah commands us to give chua. If a person is in a leadership position, if he's doing kiruv, for example, obviously he wants to impact on someone else. We read in the Haftorah for Mincha and Yom Kippur, Mafti Yona. What's Mafti Yona all about? Yona is sent to rebuke the people of Nineveh. He's not excited about the dog, but it means to have an influence. Not to say, well, freedom, you know, you live your lifestyle. No, God has sent me to warn you that you better improve your ways. That's the midst of Tochacha. And what is Tshuva? What is Yom Kippur all about from beginning to end? From Kol Nidri to the Elif, not about rebuke. Maybe we're rebuking ourselves. But it's a responsibility even towards others. Parents towards children. And even a spouse is responsible. But again, you have to do it out of love. So how do we find the proper balance? On the one in Yom Kippur, Tshuva, Tochacha, these are all ideas in which we do want to dominate to some extent and influence and inspire and change someone else's way of life. And we're obligated to do so out of a sense of caring for them. On the other hand, to be careful about dominion. And I believe that the word me'ila that's used to describe this last fila is a paradoxical word. On the one hand, it indicates no nalayim during Yom Kippur. On the other hand, me'ila means to tie down our shoes. In fact, there's one sheet in Potskim that maintains that after Yom Kippur, after the ila is finished, we put on leather shoes and we make a bracha. Sha'asa li kol tzarki. Because that bracha is not appropriate for sneakers and the like, which don't have leather in it. They don't have the status of a now. So the osali called Sarki is a bracha that fits in the case of real now life, leather shoes. Make the bracha when you put on your leather shoes for the first time on that day, the 10th of Tishra. That's the paradox of the ilah. On the one hand, Ne'ila as the culmination of 24 hours of Yom Kippur comes to disqualify the attitude of control and dominion over others. Don't try to incarcerate another person, lock them up, and you have to do it my way. That's an evil that is so typical and characteristic of our society today. It's got to be uprooted. But on the other hand, find the balance. And don't play a role of passivity and let everything go on. No, 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 no. You've got to take a proactive, inspiring and influential attitude of having an impact on a personality, inspiring that personality. But just make sure that you find the proper balance. And that's the challenge, finding that fine line of distinction between dominating, between controlling someone, like the Nile of leather that metaphorically represents man's control over everything, over all the segments of nature. And on the other hand, not to move too far away from your fellow man, 
but rather to take a proactive sense of influencing, inspiring, uplifting them. And if we do so out of love, that Amir Sashem, I am absolutely sure that in the coming year, Tav Chin Pei we will find that beautiful synthesis of these two seemingly self-contradictory modes of behavior and attitudes. And once we can integrate them and find the Shvil Azahav, that golden mean, as the Rama would call it, to know how far we go in inspiring, in sometimes castigating and uplifting, and how far we should stay away from crossing all the boundaries and becoming that control person of domination, of Na'alayim, that Rav Shlomo Zaman Orbach spoke about, which is so antithetical to Yom HaKibumi. He wrote on that we find that wonderful balance. And I think if we do so out of love, and that will guide us in our relationship, then we'll achieve that goal and that perfect integration. Let me take this opportunity to wish you all a Gemar Chasim Tova, a good and kvittel, and a prayer that Yom HaKippurim, with all its solemnity, all its seriousness and kedusha, should protect us, Mir Sashem, to the Simcha of Sukkis, Chag Simcha Seinu, Kein Yeratzon, Amen. Chag Sameh.